What's up, motherfuckers? You miss me? It's uh, we're back with uh, UFC London. It's gonna be Fabricio Verdum versus um, Alexander Volkov. And actually, pretty interested in this card. I know a lot of people don't like these cards where they're the European cards with the prospects, but I actually enjoyed going doing the footage, doing the tape work for them because they're people that I haven't really, you know, potentially seen fight before. And a lot of these guys, when I do the cards, it's uh, you know, repeat material, fights that I've already seen, having to go rewatch them. So it's pretty cool seeing new talent, maybe some people that I've never watched before and, you know, scouting them. But uh, the first fight of the night are two names that we've, uh, you know, pretty familiar with, Stevie Ray versus Cajun Johnson. Both these guys have been in the UFC for a while now. Uh, Cajun, Cajun Johnson has completely changed his style since joining the UFC. Um, he used to come forward, grapple, get in wars, little movement. And uh, he did that early on in his UFC career. He got finished. And uh, when he got finished, he came back with a new passion for movement, a new passion for being defensive. And he created a brand new style. He's fast, a good athlete. He uses that. He moves around, really doesn't engage whatsoever, gives up cage control, just lets you walk him down, uh, throw front kicks to the body, leg kicks, and then you'll eventually just try to, uh, you know, catch and uh, catch you sleeping, you know, plant, land a counter left hand. Definitely has pop in his hands. He hurt Adriana Martins and then slept him with a weird shot behind the head. Uh, he does a good job of throwing the front kick if you catch it, and um, then he'll throw the left hand and drop you with it. That's the way that he finished Martins. But uh, he does have solid grappling, but he doesn't seem like he uses it at all. He's very interested at using it at all um, anymore. And uh, like I said, after when he came back against Adriano Martins, he was a big underdog. And uh, he was coming off of a long layoff and showed good movement, great cardio, and uh, finished him. So that was an impressive fight. He was getting hit a lot with a lot of kicks. And Martins is a big muscular guy, not the greatest movement or kicks, and I think kicks will be very effective against Cajun Johnson style, a lot more effective than punches. Both these guys actually used to train together at TriStar, so that's something to uh, look into, maybe take into account. I don't know how many times they trained, I don't know if they've sparred, but definitely have seen each other, know each other's strengths and weaknesses. And uh, Stevie Ray is a kickboxer, uh, as well as having some grappling skills, and he's rejoining the UFC at a long contract negotiation. Uh, Lost to Paul Felder in a, his last fight of his contract. He rolled the dice, tried to uh, come in with some momentum, and uh, he took that loss, man, and the UFC put him on the shelf for it. I uh, guess they wanted to uh, punish him. I'm not really sure, but, you know, that KO loss uh, to Paul Felder was pretty brutal, so maybe it was good that he got some time off. And, um, you know, he has good movements and kicks. He was using that game plan to beat Ross Pearson. But he has struggled more with grapplers than with strikers in his UFC career. He got grounded out by Alan Patrick. Uh, hurt in round one by Joe Lozon. Joe Lozon really put it to him on the ground. But he's fiery. He'll go for big slams and uh, power moves at the end of the round to win the round. Good cardio. Good solid chin. He's only been TKO'd that one time against Paul Felder. And uh, in contrast, uh, Cage Johnson has been KO'd four times. So... Um, Definitely feel like Caden Johnson has the more wear and tear as the fighter. And Stevie Ray is the better fighter everywhere. Um, you know, he has good kicks, real solid uh, right hand. And uh, he's just motivated, you know, just got a new contract. Just had, uh, you know, the UFC dream flash before his eyes where he thought maybe he uh, wasn't going to get a chance to come back in the UFC. And, um, you know, Caden Johnson's been very inactive in his UFC career. He has other things going on in his life. He's doing the... Project Spearhead with Leslie Smith. He's opening TriStar Ontario. And, um, you know, that's why he had the recent layoff, I think. He was trying to open that gym, TriStar Ontario. And um, I'm not saying that he's not uh, a solid fighter. He's not anything. But I just think Stevie Ray's a bit more committed than him. I think Stevie Ray's better all around. And um, I think Stevie Ray's going to come back into the fold and take a decision here. And um, I'm still decently high on Stevie Ray. I think that he could still, you know, maybe make a move into the uh, top 20, 25 range by the end of the year and then potentially get another top 15 matchup. But uh, up next, we have um, Mark Godbeer versus Dmitry Sovnitsky. Or uh, hopefully I'm saying that right. Um, but, you know, Mark Godbeer, he's fought a couple times in the UFC, and Dmitry is going to be uh, coming off almost a three-year layoff which is pretty crazy. I'm not sure um, 
what injuries he's had because he's pulled out of multiple fights with non-disclosed injuries. So he's still trying to fight, but I'm sure why he can't, to be honest with you. But he's training at ATT. He's a protege of uh, Alexi Olenek. I've seen Alexi in his corner in a lot of his fights. So probably should be pretty good at jiu-jitsu. And he has a good build for heavyweight. Tall, built with a solid frame. Very physically strong. But he is stiff on the feet. He keeps his chin high. But he wastes very little time trying to get the fight to the ground. And he is explosive. He's athletic. And uh, he'll kind of explode, throw wild punch combinations, get inside and clinch with you. Push you against the cage, work for body locks, and work for singles and doubles. And on top, he progresses fast. He'll get the mount very well, rain down shots, solid leg kicks on the feet. He was taken down in one of his fights that I watched, and he was able to reverse in a full mount, take the back, and get the rear naked choke. So I think he's strong off of his back as well. His uh, back control was very good when he was on the back mount, and he has a strong mount as well. So he's going to be very hard to get to get off of you if he can get on top. And uh, Mark Godbeer is an English heavyweight, so he's going to be fighting at home. Likes to kickbox, throws heavy leg kicks. Uh, really hurt the leg of Daniel Spitz in their fight. Nice right hand, but he doesn't have good control of range. He just crashes forward with hard punches. He'll go body head. He lunges forward with a jab. Nice left hook right hand and uh, left high kick as well. He isn't the most athletic guy, but he does what he does and uh, kind of workmanlike. He is coming off a knockout against, um, who was that, Walt Harris, I believe. But it got awarded as a DQ victory because it was an illegal shot. Um, Godbeer has had uh, only one fight in his career go to decision. And he has nine TKOs, so he has had a problem with grapplers in his career. And he doesn't really uh, have any ground game to talk about, to be honest. But he does have that power on the feet with the nine TKOs. Uh, he showed basically no takedown defense against Justin Ledette. And uh, after he was taken down, gave up his back, was submitted. Gassed out pretty badly after round one as well in uh, a lot of his fights. And uh, even though Savnitsky hasn't fought in nearly three years, he's just a horrible matchup for Mark Godbeer. He's the better athlete, much better grappler. And uh, even with the layoff, man, I think that he's going to be able to take down Godbeer. I think the Russian's going to get that full mount like he always does. And... I think it's going to be early, man. I think it's going to be a dominant decision victory for Dimitri. I think he's going to take down Mark Godbeer round one and uh, ground and pound him out, man. And, uh, that's my prediction for you guys. I'm going with, um, yep, I'm going with Dimitri first round finished by ground and pound. And then uh, up next, we have a fight with uh, Paul Craig versus Magomed and Kalaf. And, um, you know, Magomed is a... Uh, Debuting Russian, another uh, Russian fighter on this card that's debuting. He's actually someone on the uh, Akhmat fight team. So everyone knows kind of about the Ark, Ark, Akhmat fight team. They're a little bit of a tumultuous team because of the they're um, funded by a Chechenian leader. He's pretty brutal. and um, But they owed a lot of good fighters in that gym, man. They have uh, Abdul Karim Adilov, who just debuted earlier this year with a dominant victory. Uh, Magomed and a couple others, uh, you know, as Russians that are really good in that camp. And, uh, as a Russian, you know, he obviously has the wrestling and grappling down. And on top, he lands some absolutely ruthless and devastating ground and pound, man. He puts, he put his last two opponents out cold with ground and pound. And, uh, you know, he'll rip to the body, then rain down super hard shots to the head. And, uh, just leave you slump, man. And, uh, actually seems to have some decent movement and striking skills as well. Uh, smooth with his strikes, uh, not looking very robotic, not looking stationary. He was throwing and moving. And he didn't just come forward like a freight train, like a lot of Russians. He was using solid footwork, striking from the outside, throwing the jab, solid high kick. He can get hot caught with his head stationary and get tagged. But he eats shots very well. You know, he didn't seem like he ever wobbled or anything and uh he smashed Wagner Prado who's a former UFC vet fluid good kicks to the body good kicks to the legs and to the head so he's very dexterous with his leg kicks good takedown defense and usually when you try to take him down you're going to end up reversed on your back or against the cage and uh Magomed will duck his head when he gets close to close the distance so he definitely has to be careful with knees and uppercuts but he does set shots up well punches and uh, when he gets in his clinch, his trip takedowns are very good, very powerful. He likes to close the distance with hard step in knees. And he really looks like the real deal, man, a good prospect. And uh, they're throwing kind of softball at him, in my opinion, and Paul Craig. 
Paul Craig has uh, been knocked out back to back times, and they're kind of life changing knockouts. You know, his last finish, absolutely brutal finish by Khalil Roundtree. Um, you know, in his uh, UFC debut, he was able to get a solid uh, come from behind win against Luis Henrique. He submitted him after losing uh, that first round. He has a solid jiu jitsu game, eight submissions, and he's won all of his fights but one uh, by submission. So um, definitely that's one of his most dangerous parts of his game. Um, his other one fight he won was by TKO. So all of his wins are by finish. And none of his fights have gone the distance. And uh, he's been TKO'd in his last two fights. Uh, I would be very surprised to see Craig take down Ankalov. Um, so it's going to be a very difficult matchup for him. Ankalov is long. or Craig is long. He pops shots. Uh, doesn't have that one punch KO power. Good dirty boxing, you know, attack with hard uppercuts, solid knees. Good job of staying long with his boxing, kicking combinations, and uh, actually sets him up decently well to shoot after them. You know, he, he goes for takedowns off of his combinations. Isn't super confident on top of his control, so you'll make sure he keeps the position. Works short elbows, works punches, but he doesn't really posture up. Doesn't have a super active top game. Has a good triangle choke if you take him down, as well as a guillotine. He's a... Uh, Former Bama champ, and he has really no problem giving position for his guillotine. Uh, although he's good off, good at it off of his back, um, it's not the place you want to be. So giving up position for that guillotine isn't something that I really like, to be honest with you. But off his back, he does a pretty good job protecting himself, not taking damage. But he doesn't get up very well, so he can't get grounded. And he struggles getting control against the cage as well. Against De Silva, he was shooting out a nice jab, and if you get him moving backwards and throw overhands to counter the jab, but he really has little answer to that, and he'll crumble, man. He doesn't react well to shots, and after being finished back-to-back times, who knows what his chin's going to be like. And he really seems to fall in love with one-shot combinations or one-shots and get super predictable. Like, um, in his last fight, he was throwing the high kick over and over and with really little power, just kind of like a rage finder. But he is good at closing the distance with um, a 1-2 or straight punches. And he feels comfortable and hangs out grinding against the cage. Even though it's uh, him getting pushed against the cage well at times. But he doesn't have the greatest wrestling. He will get bullied in the cage. He always goes for the overhook and he doesn't ever get his underhooks. And you'll get kneed and uh, goes for these stupid judo throws. Um, he showed very little re- resistance against Tyson Pedro and just got smashed early. And uh, this is just an easy fight, in my opinion, for um, Magomed. I think that he's going to go in there. I think he's going to take down Paul Craig really early in this fight. And I think it's going to be a brutal ground-and-pound finish. I mean, you guys should see some of this guy's uh, ground-and-pound finishes on the uh, regional scene or the Russian scene or wherever he's fighting. I can't really remember. But just brutal power. I mean, the guy really was – really has really amazing ground-and-pound. But – up next, we have another prospect that I'm really pretty high on in uh, Hakeem Dawadu, who's fighting against Danny Henry. And uh, Hakeem Dawadu's a guy who's been fighting in uh, WSOF. He's extremely athletic, a striker, huge power. So he's beaten some solid competition as well in WSOF. He had a draw with uh, Marut Magomedov, who is a, a beast wrestler, a Russian. And then uh, they had another fight, and he won by TKO. And uh, just recently, he beat Steven Seiler, who's... Pretty respected, tough guy. He steadily improved his takedown defense, and he gets better at sprawling and uh, reading the entries as the fight goes on. Definitely purely a striker. Uh, he'll wear you out with hard body shots. He'll hammer knees to the body in the clinch. Does a great job of attacking with hooks to the body. Very explosive combinations, and if he gets you moving backwards, he can unload with some really long punch combinations. He has big power in his kicks, and he was eating up the legs of Steven Styler in the last fight. Good movement, but sometimes he can get hit when he stands in the pocket and throws punches. Still needs to improve his takedown defense if he wants to beat the best in the world. But he is someone who's steadily improving, is young in the sport, and I think he could be a force in the UFC very quickly. You know, with this striking power, athleticism, he's already a danger to anyone in that division. He's been training at SBG Ireland for this camp. I'm not really sure why, but... Maybe they're going to be helping him with the striking, but off of his back, he doesn't have much, you know, and struggles to get up from bottom, but he does a decent job of protecting himself from any big damage, 
and he has great cardio in that third round. He'll start to walk you down and uh, try to finish, you know. He got a 10-8 against Magomed in that first fight, which he was losing, and that was uh, the way that he was able to get the draw. And he finished Chucha Willis brutally after being taken down and uh, controlled in round one. But uh, Danny Henry as well had an impressive comeback victory in his UFC debut at 155 pounds. So now he's going to be coming down to 145 pounds. And he's going to be a very, very big featherweight. Very tall, very lanky. You know, he's uh, 5'11". So definitely he's going to have the reach advantage here. And uh, he's a grinder, man. He was taking a beating in that first round against uh, Tamor eating some hard shots, and it seemed like they just did not affect him. He, he was able to just walk right through him, come back, and win the last two rounds because Tamor emptied his gas tank in round one trying to finish him, you know. Got wild, throwing a lot of spinning techniques and uh, throwing a lot of heat. And uh, I just think Hakeem is more composed with striker than Tamor, and he finishes much more surgically, you know. Henry will throw nice straight punches, but they're not the fastest, and they seem – easy to see coming uh he walks you down with his chin high and hands low and he'll make you work uh he'll go slowly break you down and finish you uh, he is a finisher and he'll go for the kill when he thinks he has you finished for sure attack with uh heavy shots to the body as well both guys love to attack the body uh, he'll go for single legs but he doesn't seem like much of a wrestler and doesn't have great drive on his shots but if he does get on top he will attack with heavy ground and pound and uh, really will try to finish. He'll try to get the mount and just rain down shots. He'll attack with the guillotine off your takedown attempts. And he uses that to get top position. And uh, he'll attack heavily to the body with step in knees. He doesn't have that one punch knockout power, even big power on his shots, I don't think. But he does have a good rear naked choke. And um, does have the ability to take punishment and then slowly just wear on you and come back with volume and just kind of just outwork you, just out tough you. And um I think that this is Hakeem's fight to lose. And I just think that you should be able to get a knockout in this one. Maybe in round one. If Henry's uh um tough, you know he is extremely tough and if he survives he's able to go to the distance. I just don't think uh Dewada will empty his gas tank like Tamor did and I think he's gonna be able to have a dominant striking um victory in this one. I think that he's gonna be able to keep it on the feet and I'm pretty confident that Hakeem Dewadu will get the victory here. He's one of my most confident picks as well. And, um, yeah, so I'm going to go with Hakeem Dewadu in that one. And uh, up next, we have Jack Marshman fighting. And Jack Marshman's actually a uh, pretty fun fighter, man. He's had some fun fights in the UFC. And uh, he's a boxer, you know, likes to come forward, uh, heavy hands. He's from Wales. But I think this is a loser leaves town match. You know, both guys after... Pretty hot UFC starts have cooled off and uh, lost lost like a few uh, recently. You know, Brad Scott's lost his last fight. And uh, he went back to training at the MMA lab for this camp after not doing it for his previous camp. But he really had a stinker of a performance in his last fights, you know, against uh, Jack Hermanson. Uh, he was taken down and um, was able to uh, get put in a back mount really quickly and just pound it out. Even though he wasn't hurt, he just couldn't get out the position but uh you know i'm really not a big fan of the style of brad scott but i can't lie it's pretty oddly effective uh forward pressure fighter makes the cage extremely small pushes you backwards just walks through your shots literally unfaced seems like he has a really hell of a chin really relies on his chin very effective with his front hand he'll use it more often than most fighters there's a jab a lead hook and always has that right hand cocked with big power on it he can get hit a bit with uh, wide and loopy on his shots. Uh, he can get a bit wide and loopy on his shots, but that just seems to be his style. I don't know. He will throw teeps to the body. He does a good job of cutting you off and uh, not reaching with his punches, but he isn't the most fast, fast or athletic guy. He will throw the right hand to the body as well. He puts a lot of weight on his front leg, and it's definitely there to be kicked, so someone could really take out that front leg. Sometimes Wayne's forward a bit reckless and gets caught coming in, Solid clinch control, pressure against the cage, uh, really good recovery if he gets rocked, uh, has a really good recovery time, just gets back up and is able to uh, continue the fight, and uh, really likes to grind against the cage, uh, you know, he, he's a pretty physical guy, strong for the division, and um, decent clinch takedowns, and um, he's actually hard to take down himself as well, he's uh, pretty well-rounded with five KOs, five submissions, 
Had a nice guillotine on Dylan Andrews. Um, you know, he had a victory one year ago in the same arena, basically one year ago to the day. Had some good leg kicks in that fight and a really nice uppercut. And uh, overall, Brad Scott's very physical and durable. Good cardio, good pressure and pace. He'll grind and uh, wear on people as fight goes on. And especially even get his clinch and knees game working. Um, but he's alternated wins and losses in UFC career. Had a loss last time out, so we'll see if he keeps the trend going with the win here. He's going to get two in a row for the first time in his career. But uh, Jack Marshman in his last fight actually fought a similar fighter in terms of... Uh, the forward pressure, eating punches, and uh, cardio, and uh, Ryan Janes, and he struggled a bit. You know, Janes doesn't have the same physicality of Scott, and I think Scott will be thrown with uh, a lot more heat, and he's going to have better takedowns in a uh, clinch control game. But um, Ryan Janes is someone that takes a lot of punishment, keeps coming, and by that third round, Jack Marshman was the one that seemed worse for wear in that fight. So it definitely um, seems like Jack Marshman might struggle with this style, but, um, you know, he's a boxer. He likes to uh, wane forward and just try to land hard hooks. Nice power left hook that can KO people. And he'll attack with a lead uppercut. He definitely has fast hands in the pocket. And in the first round, he's very dangerous. He'll attack with uh, heavy shots trying to finish, you know, dig to the body as well. Barely throws any kicks, and he'll never really initiate grappling situations. His grappling is pretty much non-existent. In his last fight, he really had a terrible performance in the grappling against uh, Antonio Carlos Jr. It was just taken down and uh, finished very quickly in that one. But um, he has a good one too. And both guys have a good chin, but I think Scott's probably um, a lot more durable. You know, Scott's never truly been finished by a bad TKO or KO'd, like I said, in his last fight. It was more of a positional thing. But... Um, Marshman has been KO'd four times, and he has some serious deficiencies in his ground game. Not very good defensively or at getting up, and he definitely slows down big time after round one. His hands get much slower. His counters get less sharp. Early on, his counters are very sharp, but um, I don't think he knows how to defend someone pushing him against the cage or putting heavy pressure on him. He's better when he's the one moving forward, landing sharp combinations, staying in your face and countering. And uh, he has much less tools than Scott. I think Scott's been showing new wrinkles in his game, while Marshman is not. You know, Marshman still only throws hammers in his boxer. And Bradley Scott should be able to walk down Marshman, get in his face, wear him down, clinch him, just try to take him down, just make him work. And I think Marshman's definitely going to be dangerous early. Scott has to worry about getting knocked out. But I think after round one, uh, Scott will start to uh, really put the pressure on him, put the pace on him, and just be the more active um, and just the guy that has more cardio. And I think he's going to win a decision here 29-28. But the first round is definitely a danger zone for Bradley Scott. So he has to mind his P's and Q's early on. But um, I'm going to go with Bradley Scott in this one by decision. And uh, up next, you have a pretty fun fight. You know, Danny Roberts against Oliver Enkamp. And uh, Oliver Enkamp set to make his second appearance after putting up a pretty valiant performance on Shote Nordis versus a top 15 guy in uh, Nordin Taleb. He was take he has taken a lot of time off, really worked on strength and conditioning. He wants to become a bigger, stronger welterweight, and it definitely shows. In his social media post, he's looking ripped, uh, great shape, a lot bigger than he was before physically. He's long, solid range striker, throws a lot of spinning kicks, flashy techniques from the outside. Really good check hook when you come inside. He's light on his feet, able to be uh, fast, keep his range. And he makes him a hard guy to hit in there. You know, he's a karate guy. Great great traditional uh, martial arts techniques. But he definitely needs to refine his other skills on the feet a bit. His boxing, his aggression are just not at the level they should be in uh, UFC. In his previous fights, uh, he gets kind of in a more of a point karate game. And if you pressure him hard and get him backing up, I think he is susceptible to being finished. Um, his kicks can be a bit telegraphed, but he does have solid leg kicks, and he's drop guys with spinning heel kicks and uh, flashy techniques. He's a solid grappler as well. He prefers to work from top position and uh, likes to be in the guard, going for ground and pound. He'll really get uh, posture and rain down punches if he can. Uh, he likes the half guard position as well, and he'll work from there uh, while having some solid competition, <laughs> some solid confidence in uh, keeping the position. 
and he does a great job of uh, floating and transitioning uh, with you on the ground. Uh, he'll take the back very quickly and um, work uh, work from there. He, he's really good at uh, just staying on top. And when he gets on top, he's really hard to get off of you. And uh, young and developing still, so I think he should show another level of improvement in this fight. He has four submissions to go along with the TKO and two decisions. And he's never been finished. And uh, good timing on his double legs, but he's much better at finishing him against the cage than in the center. And uh, he'll fake an oblique kick and come over the top with the right hand. Off his back, he's active with submissions. Solid at defending himself. Uh, extreme dexterity in his legs. He could throw up uh, submissions or cover guard very, very well. A great triangle. And if Encamp truly addresses his uh, strength deficiency, he may be able to become a player in this division. You know, he has a skill set already. Already, He just needs to address his physicality and his aggression. And um, against Tlaib, he was struggling to find his range a little bit early, and he was short with a lot of his combinations. And he was shooting from way too far out. And his length really played to his advantage in that fight. So he was able to close the distance quickly and do a great job of uh, landing the double against the cage. And he has cardio and a solid chin. And he won't freak out or quit in fights. Very calm and collected. Um, he's still probably the most dangerous to the submission game. Even after all those years of karate and ground and pound. Um, he'll be able to attack with some arm bars versus Tlaib. Uh, he definitely attacked with some arm bars. Uh, Against him that were pretty effective. and uh, But he can get too complacent off his back and lose rounds that way. But in the clinch, he was landing hard knees to the body. And he ate some hard punches from Taleb. And he showed he had a solid chin and a solid cardio as well. And I think he's a good prospect. And Danny Roberts is a good striker. Uh, nice crisp boxing, solid kicks. He likes to use lateral movement, walk you into his kicks and punches. Very nice jab, left straight combination. Great accuracy and power on it. He'll throw a right check hook as well if you're getting too aggressive with him. And uh, throw the inside leg kick and then go to the body and the head as well. Uh, he can get walked down. If he gets caught against the fence, uh, he's there to be unloaded on. And his grappling looks like it needs major work as well. But Mike Perry was able to uh, take him down, take the back and control, land some hard elbows from side control. And Robert showed very little defense on his back and really struggled to get back up. Uh, he only has those very few attacks, and he can get predictable. He'll jam, he'll start to spam that jab left straight combo over and over, and the inside leg kicks and body kicks. And uh, sometimes he decides to stand and trade and throw hard shots with his feet planted to try to steal the rounds at the end. And he can get clipped doing that because he starts to throw so hard he gets his feet out of position, uh, stops caring about defense a little bit. But he has a nice question mark kick that he'll throw. And uh, he'll for sure be the one with more pop on his strikes, I think, and maybe a bit more fluid on the feet than Encamp. But Encamp has much more weapons and uh, way better in the clinch and on the ground from top or bottom position. Uh, Roberts has been finished badly in two of his last three fights. Uh, knocked out really bad by Nordin Taleb really early, who uh, Encamp went three hard rounds with, uh, even won the first round. So Roberts got knocked out really bad by a head kick in that fight. And he seems to slow down as the fight goes on. And uh, when he gets hit, he starts to react badly to it. Uh, he has a knockout of Bobby Nash in between uh, his losses. But Nash is super chinny. And he was tuning up Roberts uh, previous to the knockout. This is a good matchup for Oliver and Camp. As, uh, I think he'll be able to uh, work a distance. I think he'll be able to take down and control Roberts in the clinch. And you have to question Danny Roberts' chin at this point. Um, definitely had some life-changing KOs and. Uh, and Cap definitely needs to mind his P's and Q's, closing the distance and in the pocket with Roberts, because he doesn't want to get clipped with a hard head kick or left hand. And um, But I think he's going to find a way to get the fight to the mat in round two, get the back and get a rear naked choke. Uh, Roberts does have submissions off of his back. He caught Nate Coy in a guillotine, but I don't think it was really because he has a strong submission game. It was more catching Coy slipping and... Uh, the knockouts he's had, uh, he's had have been brutal. He was flatlined and didn't even remember against uh, Nordin Taleb, arguing with the ref uh, like he was fine after he was out cold. And against uh, Mike Perry, he was uh, on his back climbing that imaginary ladder, you know, that people do when they're so out. And uh, he's just returning three months after getting KO'd really brutally. So fast turnaround here for Danny Roberts after that knockout. And I just think Oliver Encamp's going to be ready for him. I think that he's 
his training's going to pay off. His strength and conditioning plan's going to pay off. And um, he's going to get a second round submission by Rear Naked Choke. And then up next, we have two debuters. Charles Bird is uh, coming in. He came in off the Dana White Contender Series. And he's going to be fighting the uh, white Mike Tyson, John Phillips. And uh, John Phillips is another SBG Ireland guy. He's been uh, asking for a chance to fight in the UFC for a long time now. Uh, he's had a knee injury visa issue since joining the UFC, so this is going to be his first fight in a year and a half. And, um, you know, he brings 18 career KOs, TKOs, so he definitely possesses that one-punch KO power, especially in his left hook. Comes out very quickly throwing hard cooks, and he'll try to overwhelm you and finish you early. Throw nice shots in uh, the dirty boxing range as well, such as body punches and uppercuts. He likes to come forward and brawl in a phone booth. You know, he's very willing to take a shot to give a shot and uh, talk shit, try to goad you into a war. Struggles to fight again, fight at range against faster opponents because he truly just looks to throw hard hooks. Has a great chin and belief he could take a shot. Doesn't throw many kicks, but sometimes he'll throw a leg kick, you know, just throw it in there. But doesn't look to grapple offensively much either. Very questionable takedown defense. But he does a solid job of uh, protecting himself off his back, but he doesn't have a good get-up game. And if he gets taken down, he can be held down the whole round. Decent triangle. Uh, he'll throw hard body shots in a clinch, but shows almost no defense to takedowns against the cage. He isn't really the fleetest of foot or the most athletic guy. Um, really got dominated by Jesse Taylor, submitted quickly in round one by a guillotine. Uh, he does have a good squeeze, though. He caught someone... Uh, sleeping with the guillotine as well in cage warriors and uh that was pretty impressive you know but um charles bird is coming off a two wins on the dana white contender series he came and fought twice there he's a big athletic explosive guy uh very well-rounded former wrestler but he's been kickboxing for a long time very nice fluid kicks uh very hard inside leg kicks he'll throw the leg kicks then go high with the kick uh bird is very fast and creative with the strikes very fast and will counter with straight punches. He seems to be able to get to get countered, and I don't know how well he takes punches because he seems like he maybe doesn't have the best chin. But he has big power and uh, great scrambles and reverses on the ground. Very aggressive on top with ground and pound. He'll jump on submissions. Got a sweet triangle against Jamie Pickett. And uh, I think that Bird should be able to take down and dominate Phillips. I uh, think that he's much better on the ground, better movement, just a better athlete. John Phillips is very one-dimensional, and I think that he's going to be able to get that first-round submission. But if he does get lazy on his feet or decides to stand in the pocket and trade or, you know, um, doesn't have great movement, he could get taken out early, you know. But I think that he should, should for sure take this fight to the ground and just uh, do what he should do to John Phillips. I think that he should get the win here. And uh, that's another one of my more confident picks of the night, to be honest with you. And uh, up next, you have one of my, uh, you know, I've been really looking forward to this fight for a few weeks now. It's really been on my radar. And um, Leon Edwards versus Peter Sabota. And a very intriguing fight. You know, the winner should definitely uh, find themselves in line for a big time fight after this one. Uh, Sabota's 4-1 and one since uh, coming back to the UFC for the second time with two finishes. And uh, Leon Edwards has been... Um, you know, working on becoming more well-rounded since he joined the UFC and definitely paid dividends, four consecutive victories and a 6-2 and two record in the UFC. And he's taken out some good fighters in his career, Vincente Luque, Albert Tumenoff, Brian Barberina. And uh, Sabata in his first UFC set was more purely a grappler and jiu-jitsu guy. But uh, since he came back, he's really improved his striking, good timing, good choice on his shots with good power. You know, he clipped and dropped Nicholas Dobby with a short uppercut and then proceeded to dominate the fight with his top game. Very heavy, tight top game. Uh, work with methodically pressure passes, land elbows and punches while looking to keep control and wait for you to make a mistake. Great counter right hand that he slips in very cleanly. Uh, throw vicious leg kicks and kicks to the body that are just thudding. You know, really strong, big power on him. Great job blending the strikes and grappling together. You know, he'll get double legs off of... Uh, combinations has pretty tricky entries he has a good double gets the cage strong clinch takedown he likes to get the front headlock position when you try to stand up and will you know slowly move to the back or make you give him side control good cardio for the full 15 minutes and you'll play smart have a game plan 
Solid check left hook and a jab. His jab straight right combination is probably his best combo. Really nice. Uh, he's a finisher. You know, finish 15 of his 17 wins. Five TKOs, 10 submissions. Uh, really nice. Really likes that rear naked choke. Seven rear naked chokes. Uh, very well rounded. You know, he's starting to come into his own. Um, his one loss was a body kick, which froze him against uh, Kyle Noak. He tried to fight back. You know, he was in agony, but uh, the ref stopped it. And uh, the knee KO he had on Ben Saunders was just nasty. And you know, with his newfound striking and uh, being a Dean Lister black belt, he's going to be a tough out for anyone in the welterweight division. You know. Definitely uh, has great timing on that uppercut. I really like that uppercut that he throws. But uh, Leon Edwards came in the UFC as a uh, flashy striker. But uh, he's changed his style as well. Now he's a solid point fighter. Uh, improved immensely with his grappling. Uh, great clinch takedowns, body locks, double legs as well. On top, he isn't extremely active. But good control will hold half guard and then hold side control. Uh, fast hands can land uh, long combinations when you're stuck against a cage. Really digs to the body with the shots. He'll go back up top. Sometimes he seems to get uncomfortable on his feet or just kind of stuck at his game plan. He'll go for takedowns when he's winning the striking or, you know, push for hard uh, clinch body locks and get reversed off and put on his back. But he does, has decent takedown defense and good, uh, you know, defense off of his back. But he doesn't get up extremely well and, uh, I believe if he goes in this fight with a heavy grappling game plan, uh, Sabato will win the fight. And uh, Edwards will be a bit uh, more athletic and faster. Both guys are southpaw, so this takes away that hard left body kick that both guys like to use, you know. And this is the second southpaw in a row for Leon Edwards. Both guys can do a great job of uh, catching kicks, taking the, taking you down off the kicks. And uh, both also like to get the back. You know, Sabat is definitely more dangerous with submissions than Leon is. But Leon did submit Albert Chimenoff with a rear naked choke. Edwards can get out hustled on the feet. And I believe that's why he kind of started to use his uh, heavy grappling game plans to not get out hustled, lose decisions. And if he doesn't get the finish uh, on the feet in a real striking affair, he seems like he doesn't have a lot of volume. But he has great switches on takedowns too if you try to take him down against the cage. He'll uh, be able to switch, get top position. Likes to work at the cage, uh, use clinch control as well. Throw a jab hook combo, and he can get uh, eight up with leg kicks though. And um, when he takes the back, he worries almost much, almost as much about holding position as he does getting the rear naked choke. He'll hold and waste the clock in positions, you know, where he has the advantage against the cage. Very savvy. His techniques are more. His takedowns are more technique and. Uh, you know, continuing to chain wrestle. His initial shot isn't as good. But uh, Peter Sabota has been coming in with a completely different plan. His plan has been to come in and uh, finish guys, you know. And Sabota has been hurting people with the first shot he lands in his last couple of fights. Uh, much more dangerous. Um, you know, he hurt Ben Saunders with almost the first punch he landed. Same thing against Nicholas Dobby. hurt him very early in round one. And... Um, you know, he's been much more dangerous in his recent fights. You know, Edwards always comes strong in round one. Uh, he got dropped and was uh, ground and pounded pretty badly versus Brian Barberina in round two, though. And I believe at one point in this fight early, Sabato will catch uh, Edwards with the uppercut, drop and hurt him, and uh, he'll be able to keep top control and heavy ground and pound. And um, I think he's going to get a submission, get a submission finish in round two or win a decision 29-28 or 30-27. And uh, I'm going with Peter Sabota with the small upset here. I think he's going to be able to uh, pull it off. I'm really a fan of the way that he's been fighting lately. And I think both guys could make that move into the top, uh, you know, 10 pretty easily. Um, I'm pretty uh, happy that they have Leon Edwards at 15 finally. You know, he's beaten a lot of good guys and uh, definitely deserve to be in the rankings. And up next, we have the, um, you know, battle between uh, Prospect and... Um, Potential prospect killer, I guess. They keep giving Terry out where all these big time prospects. You know, he fought Cody Stamen, he fought um uh Tom Duke or not, he's fighting Tom Duke and Juan now. He fought against Sean O'Malley, so they have him getting uh getting some, you know, pretty hard matchups in for him though. So uh you know, Tom Duke and Wall and Terry on Ware both are strikers, you know, Terry on Ware, um you know, he's someone that makes people work. You know, he'll he'll come forward. He made uh, Sean O'Malley work 
but not the most technical striker. And I think Tom Dukenwa is much more uh, technical striker. Great offense with his striking, but he definitely needs to show up his defense. He's very hittable, but he is a great athlete, solid power, very good clinch with uh, with knees, nasty elbows. He's great at landing to the body, tiring you out. Good scrambles, good get-ups. Uh, doesn't look to take people down himself, but really good at getting back up to his feet. Uh, great pace, great cardio, and he'll break people down. Uh, he's been in wars and shown he can uh, win, finish late, come through adversity. His wrestling is definitely still a question mark, but I actually believe he has better wrestling than Terion Ware because Terion Ware was taken down multiple times by Sean O'Malley. And uh, Ware's a boxer. He likes to bring uh, heavy forward pressure, throw a solid right hand. Uh, he'll get in your face, the boxing combination, push you back. He struggles at times to control distance. He'll smother his punches, crash into the clinch. And uh, in the clinch, he just likes to rest. And that's not a good move versus Tom Dukenwa. If you try to rest in that clinch, he's going to be uh, piecing you up with hard elbows, hard knees. And uh, Ware has a solid uh, inside low kick and outside leg kick. Uh, really good uh, attacking the legs. But those are the only kicks he throws. And uh, he also has had problems with takedown defense as well. Like I said, he got taken down at will versus Cody Stamen and also taken down multiple times by Sean O'Malley. And uh, Stamen got wear out of his game plan. He got him emotional, so he was just talking shit to him and uh, just made it extremely easy to take him down and do his thing, you know. So Ware seems to not be the uh, me- uh, most mentally tough guy, you know. The O'Malley fight uh, was Ware's to win, in my opinion. He just let it slip away. And I just think Tom Dukenwa is too clean. I think he has too much power. And I think he's going to catch uh, Terry on where uh, with a hard elbow in round two when you're trying to close that distance. And I think he's going to finish him. This is going to be a fun fight for sure while it lasts. You know, um, both guys are uh, guys that bring it. They both come to fight. So, uh, you know, props to both guys. And for the co-main event, we have Jimmy Manoa against Jan Blakovic in a rematch rematch and uh this is a pretty intriguing fight as well you know the rematch was fairly close fairly uneventful it was back three years ago in 2015 and uh the roles are reversed this time you know Manawa's fighting at home last time they were fighting in poland in uh, yannick's hometown so uh you know the roles are reversed for this one but both guys have huge power and finishing ability uh that fight against jan was uh Manawa's only decision of his career and, um, you know, that fight, like I said, was rather slow. Both guys respected each other's power, a lot of clinch work. And uh, surprisingly, Jimmy Manawa was the one having a lot of success holding Jan against the cage. But he was not super active. He was getting hit with a nice jab from Jan. Seemed a bit hesitant to close the distance without clinching and uh, getting that body lock. And uh, he was able to land some hard shots later on in the fight was when Jan faded and uh, clearly win the fight. But Manawa is an older guy. Uh, he's like 38 years old. He picked up fighting at a late age. So it is pretty remarkable what he's been able to do in such a short period of time. He is a knockout artist with uh, one-punch knockout power. You know, his uh, moniker is one shot, one kill. He has 15 knockouts in uh, 17 fights and um, or in 17 wins. In that range, he has solid kicks. He'll kick low. Uh, inside leg kicks, nice body kicks. And he usually tries to... Uh, you know, kick you to, uh, you know, get you to stop circling. And then when you stop circling, he'll come in with hard uh, punch combinations. And you'll also go high with the kick at times. Pretty athletic for his size, uh, but still a bit robotic, you know, goes in straight lines. He has a very nice left hook and it's very powerful. He'll dig to the body with it. He'll make you protect uh, your body, then go up top and uh, knock you out. You know, that's one of his main things. Great position, great precision with his left hook. He'll hit people right on the temple with it. You know, he finished Corey Anderson and uh, OSP with basically the same shot. Uh, Really nice straight right hand as well. Uh, He definitely likes that body clinch, man. He just uh, likes to get that body clinch, uh, hold a lot, land knees. Uh, Doesn't seem to set a lot of things up, and almost everything is full power. His ground game leaves a lot to be desired. You know, he has a solid sprawl, decent takedown defense, especially if you let him get his range. But if you get him down, uh, isn't the best at defending or getting up. And, uh, you know, he can get very dangerous, though, if you let him find his range. And especially if you get caught against the cage. Very calm, very good at picking his shots, uh, keep you at the end of his shots. Start to open up more, you'll throw kicks, flying knees. But he sometimes gets lazy in the clinch, can't get KO'd. You saw that in his last fight against Volk on Ozdemir. 
and uh, he has been finished bad a couple times now. So you have to start to wonder about his chin. Along with his age, you know, 38 years old, had the opportunity to get a title shot in his last fight. That was a pretty uh, devastating loss, you have to imagine, for Jimmy Manawa. And he needs to make a move now if he wants a shot at uh, UFC gold or anything like that. And uh, that loss had to be pretty embarrassing, you know, to get knocked out in less than a minute. And, uh, you know, I haven't really been liking a lot of things that he talks about, you know, fighting David Hay, just saying things that just... I don't know. It has nothing to do with MMA. Uh, I don't know who's in, who's interested in those fights. I don't know who's telling him that's a good marketing. I don't know. But uh don't really uh, think that that's the game plan for him to be thinking about boxing when he's uh, about to fight a guy like Jan, Blakovic, Jan Blakovich and about to fight a guy like Volkan Ozdemir or whatever. But, uh, you know, Jan's been in the best form of his career, in my opinion, you know, um, he's long been a dangerous fighter, you know, he proved that when he had the liver kick finish of Alir Latifi, uh, but he's been, um, looking huge, you know, much improved since joined his new camp, uh, I don't know, I don't want to, uh, say anything, but he's looking really good, uh, physically, guys, but, uh, he used to get out grappled by college wrestlers, and, um, when he fought Devin Clark, uh, recently, he was actually the one taking Devin Clark down, defended all his takedowns. He still has the devastating body kicks. He hurt Devin Clark with them. Uh, really solid elbows and top control. Uh, throw low uh, low leg kicks as well. And against Devin Clark, he landed a crazy bulldog choke, which is uh, pretty awesome. Really great jab. He was giving Jim Manawa fits with that jab in his last fight. Very good with it against Jared Cannonier as well. Moving backwards, landing the jab and inside leg kicks. And uh, Manawa doesn't do many fakes and feints, and I think that's going to be a detriment in this fight. He just moves forward and back in straight lines. And uh, Jan is going to be able to see that coming. And uh, Jan landed a nice uh, left head kick in his last fight. I'd never seen him throw head kicks before, so it was very uh, cool to see him add new wrinkles to his game. And uh, use good lateral movement, never was standing in front of Jared Kinnanier, got caught flat-footed against the cage, which is where Jimmy wants you. Uh... Did a great job of setting up double leg takedowns as well, but he wasn't really able to hold Cannoneer down. He will attack to the body with the jab as well, and um, I think he's going to be able to use a similar game plan to succeed against Jimmy Manawa. He dropped Cannoneer with the right hand left straight combo, really nice. I think he has a better chin than Man- uh, Manawa does, and more tools, you know, and I think uh, Jan has been the one that's improved since their uh, first fight. And I think it's enough to beat Jimmy Manawa now. And I'm going Jan Blakovich by decision. I think that he's going to be able to finish Jimmy Manawa late and or win a decision. I'm really not that um, confident in Jimmy Manawa's chin, man. So I really want to say a knockout. But I'm going to be uh, judicial with it and say that he wins by decision. Um, but I'm going to go with Jan Blakovich in the uh, upset there. And up next, we have the uh, main event in the evening. Uh, Fabrice Overdoom against Alexander Volkov. And, you know, uh, this is a pretty interesting fight. You know, uh, Fabrice Overdoom's obviously getting up there in age, you know, now at uh, 40 years old. So definitely older, but he doesn't seem like he's been slowing down. You know, arguably won uh, four in a row if you want to say that he beat Alistair Overeem. Very controversial fight. Uh, person that had the big moment in that fight was definitely Fabricio when he dropped Overeem. Had him really on Queer Street with that knee. And, um... You know, the first round is very uneventful. The second round went to Overeem. But, you know, very close fight in that one. And uh, since then, you know, uh, fought a couple prospects, Walt Harris, Marcin Tybora, and uh, made very quick work of Walt Harris, finished him in the first round with an arm bar. Very weird circumstances for that fight. Walt Harris took the fight on, you know, hours notice. And then um, up next in his next fight, he fought very, uh, very, very quickly. I think he fought both fights within... Uh, couple months of each other maybe a month of each other and um you know went five full rounds with marcin tybora looked pretty good you know just uh the usual fabricio with fabricio when you bet on him in you're always gonna have uh, a bit of a heart attack watching the fight just because of the way that he fights you know very dangerous style he crashes the distance is there to be hit you know definitely and uh if you time that entry that when he comes in with those big blitz entries um you know, you could knock him out exactly like Stipe Miocic did, but he's very good at um, timing those entries. He's very good at, um, you know, coming in with the explosive combinations, and he's pretty quick. You know, he doesn't have the best speed, but he's quick, you know, and explosive with his initial bursts. 
and uh, you know he'll come in with a lead uppercut, come in with a straight uh, left hand, and uh, really is pretty good at you know chaining that together. When he lands that first shot, he gets you moving backwards, gets you thinking about it. Then he lands a couple more, uh, just you know quick pitter pat shots. And he's pot shot, you know, and uh, he does that the whole fight. And by the time you know it, it's like oh shit, you know he hasn't landed anything big. He's kind of been pot shotting me, landing some uh, short punches. Uh, then get him back, landed some kicks from distance, and, uh, you know, but he's beating, he's beating me easily every round, and, uh, I think people kind of get lulled to sleep with that, because he's either way on the outside, throwing kicks, crazy kicks, you know, he, he always starts at the beginning of that first round throwing that, that, uh, you know, jumping kick, he'll throw some spinning heel kicks, he throws a lot of body kicks, and, uh, you know, pretty good with his kicks are being so big, for sure. And um, definitely doesn't seem like he's slowing down against Ty Bohr. He was going five uh, hard full rounds. Didn't seem like he slowed down at all. And, uh, you know, I think this is a decent matchup for him here against Alexander Volkov. I see a lot of people are very high on Alexander Volkov. Um, but I actually went back, watched some of his footage, you know, against Chet Congo, against Tony Johnson. Uh, he was just, uh, you know just grinded out in very boring fights wasn't able to get himself off the cage and he still kind of has some of those same problems those same problems came uh up again again against Roy Nelson and Timothy Johnson I actually thought Timothy Johnson beat Alexander Volkov Timothy Johnson was able to drop Volkov a couple times with some hard uppercuts and um you know I thought Tim Johnson won that fight but you know they gave it to Alexander Volkov but, you know, Volkov is someone that, uh, you know, he stands very tall. And I think that's why it's easy to get out, get in on his legs. Roy Nelson was able to do the same thing, kind of grind on him. He won the first round doing that. And it was a pretty close fight. But, you know, when Volkov uh, stands right in front of you, he's kind of flat-footed and he stands tall. He's much better when he starts to get his movement going. He starts to get the lateral movement going. He'll throw the front kick to the body. He'll throw the jab. And uh, when he starts to get that going, when he starts to really get into the fight, starts to get a lot better. You know, he'll start to uh, really keep his distance, keep you on the end of his shots. And uh, when he sees that he maybe stunned you or you're uh, moving backwards or something happens, he'll explode with his own uh, big combination. He'll come forward with some uppercuts, with some short uh, punches. And uh, he has some pop in his shots, but I don't think that he puts full power to his shots. I don't think that he's kind of like a knockout artist, anything like that. Definitely has some nice kicks as well. Uh, can go high with his kicks. Very long, very, uh, you know, someone that's really good at keeping his range. But I just don't like the uh, fact that he stands so tall at times and it's so easy to get it on his legs. Fabricio Verdum isn't the best um, wrestler, and that's pretty obvious. But I just think that he's going to be able to um, uh, get in on those legs, even if he doesn't take him down, push him against the cage, uh, work for the back. And just be more active, you know. I think that Fabricio Verdum is the guy that's going to be pushing the pace. I think he's going to be the one that's going to be crashing the distance with the combinations. I think he's going to be the one that's going to be trying to get the takedowns, trying to get the clinch. And uh, I think unless Alexander Volkov gets a finish here, gets a finish by knockout, which, you know, is possible. Fabricio Verdum's 40 years old. He got rocked by a head kicks kind of a little bit by Tybora. But I do think he has a great chin, you know, against Steven Miocic. Uh, got finished kind of running forward very aggressively. But, you know, I don't know. This is a very close uh, good, very close fight. I see a lot of people betting on this fight, and I'm not confident enough to even get close to betting on this fight. But um, I'm going to go with Fabrice over Doom here by decision. I think that he's going to be able to uh, just be a little bit more active than Volkov and uh, – really be able to uh, clinch him, hold him against the cage, and I think it's going to be kind of a boring, slow fight. And uh, for my most confident pick of the week, I think I'm going to go with... Hmm. I think I'm going to go with uh, Magomed Ankaliyev to beat Paul Craig. And for the uh, parlay of the week, let's go with uh, Hakeem Dawodu, uh, Magomed Ankaliyev, and Charles Bird. I think that's a pretty good parlay. And if you're looking for um, maybe an upset parlay, I would say uh, to go with Peter Sabota and Jan Blakowicz. And I think that's a, a pretty good parlay as well that you could uh, potentially hit. 
I also like Dmitry uh, Sovnitsky as well. So uh, those are the people that I think uh, I might be targeting. I might be looking at for bets. So uh, hope you guys like the show. I'm going to be um, coming back again in, uh, next week. And I can't wait for that Khabib versus Tony Ferguson card. Man, that's just the card that I've been thinking of for uh, weeks and weeks now. I can't wait to break that down for you guys. But um Hope you guys like this week's uh, edition and um, tell me what you think of my picks. Uh, comment down there. Tell me what your picks are. Tell me if you disagree, if you agree. And uh, subscribe for more. I'm still trying to get up to uh, 200, 200 subscribers. And then after that, try to get more. We're almost at um, six months with uh, doing these prediction videos. And I told uh, myself when I first started that I was going to give myself – six months to kind of just do the videos get my feet wet see what people think and um after the six months i was going to start to uh you know if i liked it if i had a uh you know people that were listening to start uh you know doing a little bit more with the visuals things like that so i'm going to try to uh you know start to uh, have better backgrounds than just the cassette tape things like that maybe um you know just uh do a little bit more professional but um Subscribe for more and hope you guys like the show. Thanks, guys.